Kia ora and welcome back. We've made some real progress this week, so let's have a quick recap and remember where we've got up to so far. So we started off with looking at systems of linear equations. So that's basically multiple linear equations where we're interested in finding values that satisfy all of them at once. Um, we introduced a matrix shorthand to show to make writing the equations down a whole lot easier. And we showed how there were three elementary row operations we could use to modify our matrices without changing the solutions to our systems. We figured out that if our system was upper triangular, we could solve it for one variable at a time using back substitution. And we also introduced the concept of the row echelon form, which was like a more general version of upper triangular. We also learned how to reduce a matrix to row echelon form by using Gaussian elimination. So that brings us up to date. We don't yet know what to do with the system in row echelon form, but we'll figure that out today. So let's start off with the example that we looked at last time. So remember that we started with a system, we put it in an augmented matrix and we reduced it to row echelon form. In terms of developing a method for solving these systems, we've actually come to a decision point. So if our system was an upper triangular form, that would mean every column has a pivot apart from the right hand side, then we could just go ahead and solve it by back substitution. Otherwise, we're going to continue on and take our system to reduced row echelon form. That's abbreviated RREF. So reduced row echelon form is like row echelon form, but there are a few extra rules. So a matrix is in reduced row echelon form if, number one, it's in row echelon form. Number two, every leading entry is a one. And number three, every leading entry has only zeros above and below it. So not just below, also we need zeros above our leading entries now. So an important property of the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is its uniqueness. So the reduced row echelon form of a matrix is unique. That means no matter what sequence of row operations you do, you're always going to end up at the same reduced row echelon form. We can get different regular row echelon forms, but as far as the reduced one goes, there's only one possible for a given matrix. So that means that two matrices that are row equivalent therefore have the same reduced row echelon form. So our job is to turn all the leading entries into ones and to clear zeros above them to move to reduced row echelon form from row echelon form. Okay, so if we continue on to RREF, the method is known as Gauss-Jordan elimination. He's a French guy, not Jordan. We start from the bottom pivot, sort that one out, and then we move upwards and left, kind of the opposite order to the Gaussian elimination that got us here. Okay, so let's see if we can do it to our matrix. So here it is again, it's 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 1, and 0, 0, 0, negative 3, 3. Okay, starting at the bottom, we see that the pivot in column 4 is not a 1, it's a negative 3. So we need to do a scalar multiplication to fix it. So we're going to take row 3, and we're going to multiply it by 1 over negative 3, or negative a third. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so that will give us 1, negative 1, negative 1, 2, 1. Okay, the first two rows are going to be the same, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 1. In the third row, we're just going to divide everything by negative 3. So it's going to become 0, 0, 0, 1, negative 1. Okay, now we need to clear entries above it, this time using row 3 to do so. You can see that the zeros to the left are going to do nothing to the entries to the uh, to the other entries uh, to the left above. So we're going to do a row operation that takes row 1 to row 1 plus something times row 3. And we're going to do an operation that takes row 2 to row 2 plus something times row 3. So see if you can figure out what those are before we move on. So pause the video and see if you can figure out what numbers those should be. Okay, so we'll do row 1 first. So... In row 1, we have a 2, and we want it to be a 0, so that means we need to take away two copies of row 3 from row 1. So it's going to be a negative 2 in that box. Okay, so our new row 1 is therefore going to be 1, negative 1, negative 1. Nothing happens to those entries because they're all zeros in the row 3. Then we're going to take away two 1s from the 2, which gives us a 0. And then we're going, then we're going to take away two negative 1s from the 1, which is the same as adding 2, so that becomes a 3. And for row 2, 
Um, we have a negative one where we want a zero, so we just need to add on one copy of row three to that one. So the new row two is going to become zero, zero, one. They don't change. Um, then you're gonna add one onto negative one to give us a zero, and then you're gonna add the negative one onto one to give us a zero also. Okay, we're not quite done yet. We now move to the next pivot, which is left and upwards. So it's gonna be the pivot in column three. We need to clear a zero above it. So that will be goes, that will be row one goes to row one plus something times row two. So notice we're now using row two to clear above at row one. What should that something be? Well, it should be just one, right? There's a negative one there. We have to make it a zero, so we just need to add a one on. So that's one copy of row two. And then our new version of row one is going to be one, negative one, zero, zero, three. And now we're in reduced ratio on form. Okay, so next we're going to work towards our general solution. So what we're gonna do now is to classify our variables. Remember the variables for this problem, they were W, X, Y, and Z, depending on whether there is a pivot in their column or not. Okay, so there are pivots in columns one, three, and four. So the corresponding variables are W, Y, and Z, and they are therefore pivot variables. The leftovers, here that's just X, everything else is accounted for, these are called free variables. So what we do is we set each free variable equal to a parameter, okay, one different one each, and we solve for the pivot variables in terms of these by back substitution. So for this example, our free variable, we've only got one is X, so we'll start by setting it to a parameter T. If we had a second one, we need to give that a second parameter like S or something as well. So we're gonna write let X equal T, and now we'll solve for the pivots starting at the bottom. The last equation says that z equals negative one, so nothing to do there, that's fine. Next equation up, that says that y equals zero. And now the first equation, that says w minus x is equal to three, which if we rearrange that for w, remember we're solving for our pivot in terms of our free, that becomes w equals three plus x, or w equals three plus t, because x is t. So now we have an expression for all four variables. We just write it down as a vector. So w, x, y, z are three plus t. Don't forget x is t. We actually specified that one up front. So x is t, y is zero, and z is negative one. And just as we did for our equations of lines parametrically, we split this up into a constant portion and a parameter portion. So it's going to be three, zero, zero, negative one. That's our constant plus t times one, one, zero, zero. This is the general solution to this system of equations. And so we can see that because there are infinitely many possible choices for t, this example corresponds to a system that has infinitely many solutions. So when we end up with free variables, that's when we get infinitely many solutions to our problem. Okay, so now we've seen examples that have a single solution, and we've seen an example that has infinitely many. What about an example, or how are we going to, what's going to happen if we have a system that has no solutions? How are we going to recognize that in our algorithm? Well, it turns out this one will spot after the Gauss, Gaussian elimination phase to row echelon form. So what will happen if there are no solutions, we end up with a row that looks like this, for example, 0, 0, 0, and the right-hand side is 3. So for that particular problem, that would, this equation would say that 0x plus 0y plus 0z is equal to 3, i.e. that 0 equals 3, which cannot be. So maybe we'll look at one that we understand. Let's look at an example in 2D of two parallel lines. So 2x plus 3y equals 1, and 2x plus 3y equals 2. Those are both lines, they're both parallel. And we can write that down as an augmented matrix as 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2. So if we go ahead and do our Gaussian elimination, we get row 2 goes to row 2 minus row 1, which gives us 2, 3, 1. First row doesn't change, and the second row becomes 0, 0, 1. We can see that the last equation gives us something absolutely impossible, so we can see that our system has no solutions. All right, so... Now we have a method that we can use to systematically solve systems of any size or shape. We can cope with infinitely many solutions by introducing parameters for our general solution, and we know what to do if we get system, or we know how to spot systems with no solution.
So to kind of sum it up uh, in a couple of steps, the method is, here's the grand seven step process for solving linear systems. Step one, we want to put the system in an augmented matrix. Step two, is reduce your matrix to row echelon form using Gaussian elimination. If you have a full set of pivots, this is step three, go ahead and solve your system using back substitution, then stop. However, if there is a row of zeros with a non-zero right-hand side, then there is no solution and you should stop. If neither of these things have happened, continue to step five, where we'll continue on to reduce the racial on form by Gauss-Jordan elimination. You will then set each free variable to a parameter each, and you will solve for the pivots in terms of these. And then we'll write our solution down finally in step seven as a vector parametric equation. So all that remains now for you to do is to do lots of examples to get comfortable with the process. But I think time for a break. You've earned it, so we'll catch up with you next time. Have a good time. See ya.